28th of July, 1847, four days since our arrival in the Great Salt Lake Basin. It had been almost four months since we left winter quarters on the banks of the Missouri. 1,200 miles from flats of the Platte Rivers and steeps of the Black Hills and Rocky Mountains. The burning sands of the eternal sage regions and willow swales. Rocky canyons and stumps and stones. mountain fever. Still, we desperately tried to plow and irrigate the land. The ground was so hard and dry, we broke several plows in our efforts. A hot, dry wind blew incessantly that day. I don't understand. This was the beginning? Yes. Toward the close of the day, Brigham Young thought we should continue our explorations of the new land of promise, despite his still being stricken with the fever. I was an apostle by then. I felt we had found the land held in reserve by the hand of God. My soul was filled with the most sublime joy as we followed Brigham northward, right to the heart of the valley. Brethren, here we will build the temple of our God. memory serves you well, President. Yes, it would seem so. But I'm afraid I have a little help in that regard, young man. Uh, here we are. Now, here's something that might interest your readers, Mr. Callahan. And what's this? A journal? Hmm? You kept a journal? Since 1834. I didn't know you fancy yourself as a writer. <laughs> I wouldn't pretend to aspire to the lofty realm of a writer. I see. No, I simply make a record of the times, if you will. The prophet Joseph Smith admonished the saints to be a record-keeping people. Joseph Smith, the founder of your church. Precisely. So when I joined the church, I vowed I would never lay my head to my pillow until I made a record of the day's work. And since then, I seldom ever heard the prophet Joseph or any of the 12 apostles teach any principle but what I felt as uneasy as a fish out of water until I had written it in my journal. You mean you actually kept a daily record since the day you joined the Mormon church? Well, not an easy task, I'll wager. Uh, obedience is never an easy task, Mr. Callahan. Uh, November 25th, what year? 1836. Please, have a seat. Of course. I wasn't much older than you, Mr. Callahan, just a lad of 29. My companion and I were returning from a mission in the southern states. Pardon me, but I'm afraid I don't understand how all this relates to the Salt Lake Temple. Oh, you will, Mr. Callahan, you will. And that was the day that my eyes first beheld a house of the Lord built by commandment and revelation in these latter days. Brother Smoot, hurry, come quickly. Come in. Abraham, come quickly. I think we're here. Hurry.
Kirtland. Yes. Kirtland. Kirtland Temple had recently been dedicated, and I was anxious to hear news of that blessed event. Oliver Cowdery and I knelt in solemn and silent prayer, and the veil was soon taken from our minds, and the eyes of our understanding were open. His was the voice through which the Lord himself had chosen to speak in this last dispensation, the prophet Joseph Smith. We saw the Lord standing upon the breastwork of the pulpit in the temple, his countenance shone above the brightness of the sun, and his voice was as the sound of the rushing of great waters. He said, I am the first and the last. I am he who liveth. I am he who was slain. I am your advocate with the Father. He spoke of the prophets of old, Moses, Elias, and Elijah. For they also had appeared to Joseph and Oliver in the Kirtland Temple to commit their keys and dispensations unto them. Well, tell me, what did you think of the Kirtland Temple when you stood inside? The completion of this temple came at a great cost and sacrifice to the saints. Yes, and the brethren and sisters have been blessed for their labors. This is only the beginning of the blessings which the Lord shall pour out upon the heads of his people. Tell me, Joseph, what are these blessings? The Lord has begun to restore the ancient order of his kingdom unto his people, to bring about the completion of the fullness of the gospel. Wilford? Keep these things and ponder them in your heart only. I understand, Joseph. Welcome home, Brother Woodruff. It had been two and a half years since I had left Kirtland to preach the gospel. My brethren then in Kirtland were poor, despised, and looked upon by the pomp of Babylon with disdain and disgrace. But how changed was the scene before me now. A magnificent house of God that speaks in language loud as thunder that the saints will prosper in spite of Babylon. For his temple stands in honor of his kingdom on earth. I'm sorry if I've disturbed you. You have a beautiful voice. And yours too, sir. My name is Wilford Woodruff. Of course, Brother Woodruff. Have we met? No. And you are? Very cold. If you'll excuse me now, I... No, wait. Please. May I call on you? You already have. No, I mean, perhaps tomorrow. Perhaps with a proper introduction, Mr. Woodruff. Good night. 
tonight. That beautiful vision I was later to discover was a certain Miss Phoebe Whitmore Carter, the local school teacher. We were properly introduced a short time later, and after a lengthy courtship of two and a half months, we were joined in holy matrimony on the 13th of April, 1837. Within the year that Kirtland Temple had fallen into the hands of apostates, many of the saints were forced from the village and the temple was desecrated. Later, it was even for a time reduced to housing cattle and barn animals for the winter. Within a decade, another temple was once again erected to the Lord in the city of Nauvoo, Illinois. A brief haven for the saints from the ravages of persecution. It was dedicated in May of 1846, amid the forced exodus of the entire city of Nauvoo. Prophet Joseph and his brother Hiram had been murdered and their testimony sealed with their blood. Within 18 months of its dedication, the Nauvoo temple was destroyed by fire. Spiteful work of an arsonist. I saw where our paper published a story about it. The treatment of your people in those days was inexcusable. It seemed the harder we labored to obey the commandments of our Lord, the more determined our enemies became. Temple sites were dedicated earlier in Independence and in far west Missouri. Even Spring Hill, overlooking a beautiful valley in the Grand River. Perhaps the most heavenly place I've ever seen. <laughs> Wanton hostilities would not allow us to tarry long enough to even begin work on those temples. They will have to wait for future generations. One would think you would have wearied at the thought of raising yet another temple. Yes, I remember some voice their concerns. Five years after arriving in the valley, the construction of the wall around Temple Block was still uncompleted. Work on the temple itself had not even begun. to exchange desks with you. you. You've more need of the warmth than I. I prefer the view from the window. <coughs> Besides, President Young will be calling on us this morning, and I would like to be forewarned. He wants to discuss the plans for the new temple. Says it's time to push forward with the work. William. Yes. Did you hear me? President Young wants to begin work on the new temple. Well, it's, it's wonderful news. I, I thought you would welcome it. So the old timers. Some of the old timers. I've heard them talk about the new temple. They say, the moment we lay the cornerstone of the temple, all hell will be turned loose upon us and, and we will be driven right out of the valley. Just as we have from every temple site since the church was founded. That may be true, Brother Ward. President. So much for my watchful eye. But once the temple work has begun, there will also be an increase in blessings and the power to overcome all evil. It, it wasn't my intention to suggest that. I know, William. But remember this. Men and women grow mighty under temple service. We must build this temple that the Lord might reveal the ordinances of exaltation to his people. And we must start today. May I use your slate? 
yes, yes, of course. Now, brethren, let me show you what has been revealed to me regarding this noble temple. There will be three towers on the east, representing the Melchizedek priesthood. And three similar towers on the west, representing the Aaronic priesthood. Soon thereafter, President Young called Truman Angel to go to Europe to study the works of the master builders of the past centuries. From the Nelson Monument in Dublin, Ireland, and the old castles on the Isle of Man, to the ancient cemeteries of Paris and magnificent houses of worship and government in London, Truman spent months contemplating, drawing, and absorbing the rich architectural legacy of the European continent. He literally spent days studying St. Paul's Cathedral, the masterpiece and final resting place of England's greatest architect, Sir Christopher Wren. So when exactly did construction on the temple begin? The groundbreaking took place on the 14th of February in 1853. It was a simple ceremony presided over by Brigham Young. Almost immediately after, President Young appointed me to superintend the excavation of the temple foundation. Beg your pardon, Brother Woodruff. Yes. The gentleman said I should see you. What can I do for you, sir? I always told you to the superintendent in charge here. Every able-bodied man, Mr. Livingston. James Livingston. Just arrived. Scotland, Lanarkshire. Can you drive a team, Brother Livingston? Just as good as the next man. What was your employ in Scotland? Stonecutter, sir. Just as good as the next man. Much better, sir. I am afraid I have no use for you here, Brother Livingston. I'm sorry. But I need you to pack your belongings, however. We can use you up the canyon to quarry stone for the temple. We've only got six more weeks before we lay the cornerstones. Can you make it? Only in God's country, sir. Brethren and sisters, we are assembled this day on one of the most joyful and glorious occasions ever to transpire among the children of man. For today, we are to dedicate the cornerstones of this temple to the Most High God of Israel. I venture to say that the sacrifices to which we commit this day and the work that we perform here will long be remembered by this people and be sounded as with a trumpet's voice throughout the world, as far, as loud, and as long as the wind can carry it. I seldom ever say much about revelations or visions, but suffice it to say that five years ago last July, I stood on this hallowed ground and saw in the spirit the temple not ten feet from 
where we laid this chief cornerstone, and I have never looked upon this ground since, but the vision of it was there. Brethren and sisters, I pray that our Father in heaven will encircle you all in the arms of its love and mercy, and protect us all while we finish this temple, receive the fullness of our endowments therein, and build many more. Superintendent? Yeah, that's right. My name's Michael Hawks. I'm your new apprentice. James Livingston. Who appointed you my apprentice? I brought you a sack full of slips and wedges. And a newly sharpened drill, fresh from a blacksmith. Why, well, you're barely 12 years old. 13. Still too young to be an apprentice. Who sent you to me? I overheard at the blacksmith that you were up working alone. All quarrying my work in teams. I manage just fine. My thanks for bearing up the tools. They were sorely needed. The work is faster with two. Run along now, lad. I've work to do. <laughs> Did you not hear me, lad? Off with you now. This is dangerous work. No place for a boy. Sharp brothers, John, Adam, and Joseph, were contracted to haul the rock from the quarry to the temple block. A four-day trip for a single wagon load. Look, Adam, can you come Okay, Sam, can you help him there? There you go, Adam. That's okay, I'm getting in there. Sam, can you watch him there on that corner over there? After the granite was hauled to the temple block, what then? 
Well, by far the largest force of men engaged in building the temple were the stone cutters on the block. Most of the rough cut stones used in the foundation were squared right there on the ground where they had been dropped by the teamsters from the quarry. Some of the skilled craftsmen who turned and shaped the finer stones worked in temporary sheds on the temple block. Truman Angel was responsible for the coarse drawings used to direct the masons in the placement of the stones in the temple. By this time, the temple block had become the industrial heart of the valley. Blacksmiths were kept busy sharpening tools daily. Foundry workers, carpenters, machinists, and a variety of craftsmen were put to work as the temple block became a beehive of activity. Spirits were high as the saints labored with determination to obey God's will and build his holy house. Overwhelming, isn't it? Hmm? The stars. I've never seen such brilliant stars in all my life. Yes, they do star something in the soul, don't they? I've spent many hours pondering these heavens. I imagine everyone does so at some time. It's only natural. Yes, it is, isn't it? Do you remember the psalm, uh, the glory, uh, oh. the heavens declare the glory of God? There is no speech, no language where their voice is not heard. Yes, that's the one. I take it you're familiar with the scriptures. Oh, uh, I was raised in a good Christian home, President. Is that right? Have you ever felt like you could just reach out there and lay hold of something? Like what, perhaps? Oh, I don't know. It's almost as if there were a part of me up there. You're not alone, Mr. Callahan. There was a time when man would climb to the highest peak of the highest mountain just to touch eternity as if to extend his reach to God himself. Like Abraham. Exactly. Abraham's faith was tested atop a mountain. Or Moses. Yes. Moses saw the almighty God face to face in the midst of Mount Sinai. And you remember it was there that God commanded Moses to build a sanctuary in his holy name, a tabernacle in the wilderness. Uh, the, where the Ark of the Covenant rested. Mm -hmm. The Lord chose to dwell among his people. And when they came to the Promised Land, God commanded that they build a permanent resting place for the ark. The temple? Yes. And once again, man has been commanded to build temples to our Lord, where we receive instruction, revelation, and ordinances from our Heavenly Father. And the chasm that stands between God and man is bridged, just as on the mountains of old. The mountains of the Lord? Yes. Brethren and sisters, we are fast approaching dire circumstances. The President of the United States, James Buchanan, having received false and ruinous reports of sedition and treason by this people, has ordered troops from the United States Army to march to our beloved territory to put down this supposed insurrection. They lie at our doorstep as I speak. It is for this cause that I have issued instructions for all able-bodied men to stand forth and aid in the burying of the temple footings and foundation, the caching of the stones therein, and the removal of all the public shops on Temple Block. Brethren, we must not allow this sacred, hallowed ground to be defiled or desecrated.
don't like the looks of this, General. Harward! Sir. Lieutenant. Take a couple of men and check out this compound. Smith! Roberts! Checks out, sir. It's just some farmer's field. Field? In the middle of the city? What do these Mormons think of next? I think they are ready to burn this city to the ground, should we so much as fire a shot. Now, let's move it, Colonel. I see nothing for us to do here. Satisfied? March! Satisfied that General Johnston and his army were to inflict no harm nor pose a threat any longer to the Saints. President Brigham Young soon thereafter announced that it was safe for all to return to their homes. Eventually, the time came to exhume the temple footings and buttresses and once again go forth with the construction of the temple. Brother Angel, I came as quickly as I could. It looks bad, President. I'm afraid we might find the same thing throughout the entire Foundation. How did this happen? We've not yet determined the cause, but on one thing we are all agreed. That this Foundation cannot support the weight of a granite temple. It's extremely dangerous. and see to it that the workmen are dismissed from the block. All right, men. That's all for today. President? I shall not move from this spot until I know what I am to do. Wilford, please, come sit down. I've heard the news. What am I to do now? Several of the Masons feel that the trouble has arisen through the use of too much mortar. The settling has caused the walls to crack and spread. Yes. Bishop Gardner warned me. They suggest that we have every stone in the entire temple, even the foundation, cut to precise measurements and then laid securely stone upon stone. Apparently, this will prevent any further cracking or settling. President, I fear it will be necessary to tear out the entire foundation and begin all over again. What more can there be? Nine years we have struggled to build this temple. 
We have suffered humiliating poverty and persecution. Our brethren have blistered in the summer sun, scalded in their own sweat. They've shuddered and soaked through torrential thunderstorms with lightning dancing all about them. They've frozen off fingers and toes in winter's blasts. We have stood against the gaping jaws of hell itself. Yet there are nights that I lie awake for fear that I will never live to see this temple dedicated. I expect this temple to stand through the millennium, Wilford, so the saints of future generations may go in and receive their endowments. You are right, my friend. We will take up the foundation and begin again. From that day forth, Truman Angel was responsible for specifying each stone in its position in the temple. And this pattern was followed throughout the rest of its construction. The women joined in the effort, supplying work clothes for the men and helping in whatever way they could. The temple progressed at a slow pace as the months evolved into years. understand why it took 40 years to build. Well, the difficulty in hauling the granite box to the temple was still the greatest hindrance to the work. Morning. President, you remember my assistant, Michael Hawks? Why, of course, Brother Hawks. Pleasure to see you again. I'm uh, sorry to intrude. I, I didn't oh, know it's you. Oh, fine, Michael, fine. In fact, have a seat. I think you might be interested in our discussion. We need to make the necessary preparations to close down work at the quarry for a time. Close us down. I know we're short on men right now, and, and the weather hasn't been exactly helpful either. No, 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 Michael. It's nothing like that. You're working miracles up here. We speak of another priority. Brother Brigham needs all the men this territory can spare to work on completing the railroad. The railroad? You're going to halt work on the temple to supply the Union Pacific with men? Mind yourself, Michael. We are not going to halt work on the temple, young man. In fact, we will be advancing it. You see, I believe that in order to complete the temple, we must first expend every possible effort to complete the railroad. Forgive me, President, but I don't see how putting our men to work on the railroad... Once the transcontinental railroad is completed, we can readily build extensions down into Salt Lake City and beyond. Not only will we be able to access supplies from the east, but we should be able to complete a line that would include the quarry itself. Perhaps run a spur straight to Temple Block. We'd be able to haul granite directly to the temple by rail. Even so, I think the men will find this a strange request. Understand, Michael. This is not a request. She'll go? Hey, she has to. 
The charge we placed on the other side looks like she didn't blow. Ah, well, she's probably soaking wet by now. Right then, I'm going up there. We need to set off another charge. I want you men to keep cover till she blows. And where would you be going? You're getting to be an old man. Thought you might like some company up there. Well, I won't be needing company like this. There's enough black powder in here to blow us all to kingdom come. I'll take the pack. Nay, that's old man's work. Right then. Let's go. Doctor says it's doubtful that he'll wake. He'll make it, Sister Livingston. He's a tough Scot. Well, the young man, Michael Hawks, refuses to leave Jim's side. and a blessing. I know it's hard, my friend. Times like these, one questions why Almighty God allows adversity to torment even the best of men. You and Brother Livingston, the work that you do is not for me or Brother Woodruff. You work for the Lord. You are building a Zion of God. You labor for his holy house. Be of strong faith, Brother Hawks, for you are to extract a granite temple from the everlasting hills with your bare hands for all the world to see for centuries to come. You are blessing millions of lives for time and all eternity. The Lord loves you for that, Michael. Will you join us, Brother Hawks? James Livingston, by the authority of a holy priesthood. 
and James Livingston? James lived. Lost his right arm, though. If I remember correctly, there was a photograph. Here we are. This is James Livingston standing next to President Young. What's this? He was fitted with an artificial arm and a hook. As soon as he could stand on two feet, he went right back to work supervising the quarry, and he remained there until the last stone was in place in the temple. Well, may I? Please. On what occasion was this taken? April the 4th, 1873. The first shipment of granite from the quarry to the temple block completely by rail. President Young traveled the train from Salt Lake to the quarries and back again to celebrate the event. The return trip took a little over an hour. That's a sight better than four days by teams of oxen. <laughs> Just a touch. <laughs> When he left this earthly life on August the 29th, 1877, the temple walls barely reached 20 feet above the ground. The rails were hauling 60,000 pounds of granite a day. Brother Brigham always said little progress would be made on the temple until we built the railroads. He was right. He was always right. Yes, come in. Come in. <laughs> come in. <laughs> Is it bedtime already? Can we say our prayers with you tonight, Grandpa? Why, of course you can. Oh, come on in, come on in. Don't be bashful. Children, I'd like to have you meet Mr. Callahan. He's a writer from New York. Mr. Callahan, these are some of my grandchildren. This is Hampton. Hello, Hampton. And this is Marion. How do you do? How do you and do? this is Sarah. Glad to meet you. My house is full of family tonight, all here for the ceremony tomorrow. Now, all right. Why is tomorrow so special? Because we're dedicated to Salt Lake Temple. Exactly. Good boy, Hampton. Now, shouldn't we remember all those who helped build and beautify the temple in our prayers tonight? Well, of course we should have. Come on. Here we go. There we are. Would you care to join us in our evening prayer, Mr. Callahan? I'd be honored. All right, now, Marion, you offer the prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, please bless my family, bless Grandpa Woodruff, and Mommy and Daddy, and all the, my other family. Bless this great land we live in, as the leaders of our church and all the missionaries. The oldest son will shine tomorrow so we can go out and play. Bless so all the people who worked on the temple and Mr. Callahan. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. All right, now, <laughs> off to bed. Good night, Hampton. Good boy. Good night, Marion. Good night. Good night, Mr. Callahan. Good night to you, Sarah. Good night. There we are. Don't worry, Mr. Callahan. They don't bite, you understand. They're wonderful children. I take it you have none? No, I'm not married. Oh, wonderful institution. I highly recommend it. I suppose I just never had the time or disposition to pursue it. A question of priorities, I imagine, and a busy newspaper man such as yourself. Yes, exactly. I have something I would like you to read. Perhaps a little off our subject, if you don't mind. No, of course not. I was attending to my duties in the temple in St. George in the fall of 1885, when I received news that Phoebe, my beloved wife, had met with an accident in Salt Lake, and I returned immediately, I found her condition very poorly. November 9, 1885. My wife is very low. 
I laid my hands upon her head and blessed her. November 10. At 2 o'clock this morning, she died. We part after living together 48 years in the marriage covenant. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Sleep on, my dear Phoebe. But ere long from this, a conquer tomb shall yield its captive prey. Then with husbands, children, friends, prophets and apostles, thou shalt reign in bliss as wife, queen, mother and saint to an eternal day. I am passing through a strange chapter in the history of my life. I hope I may prove true and faithful to the end that I may join her in the celestial kingdom of God and dwell with her in peace forever. This seems a very personal matter, President. Mr. Callahan, you have come nearly 3,000 miles to write the story of the Salt Lake Temple. If the truth be known, this is the story of the temple the reason why we build them. Death of my Phoebe was a sorrowful and difficult time for me, but I knew within my heart that she was not lost to me. We would always be man and wife, for we had been married for time and all eternity. Time and eternity? Yes. Marriage is one of the sacred ordinances performed in the temple, and it is not just till death do you part. Do you mean to say that man and wife can remain married even after death? Yes, if covenants are kept, Families that are joined together in the temple are united in a relationship through all the eternities to come. I've not heard much of these covenants. I was told that they're secret. Sacred would be a more appropriate term. One of the purposes of the temple is to allow all those who are worthy to make sacred covenants with our Father in heaven. Uh, sacred covenants? How do you mean? Well, in ancient times, Abraham made covenants with the Lord. And if he lived according to God's commandments, the Lord promised Abraham he would bestow certain blessings upon him. So in the temple, you make similar covenants with the Lord? Yes. Uh, what purpose do they serve? I mean, what are these blessings then? Brigham Young taught that it is necessary to receive these ordinances in the house of the Lord, so that after departing this life, you may walk past the angels that stand as sentinels, back to the presence of the Almighty Father and receive exaltation. So, ultimately, the path through the temple leads on to exaltation? Yes. Is it true that you also do this work for the dead? Yes. I just thought that some people might find that... Many people believe in some form of vicarious work for the dead. The atonement of Jesus Christ was a vicarious work. Whoever accepts Jesus as a savior also accepts the principle of vicarious proxy. Huh. I suppose I never thought of it quite that way before. Once we receive these ordinances for ourselves, we then return to the temple and make those same covenants in behalf of our ancestors, those who lived in earlier times and did not have the opportunity to do so for themselves. We, the living, act as proxy for the dead. So in a way, you're linking together all of your generations down through the centuries. Precisely. These were the keys and the authority that Elijah the prophet bestowed upon Joseph Smith in the Kirtland Temple. Oh, Elijah, uh, I seem to remember a scripture about that, uh, something about uh, fathers and children. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And, and he, he shall, shall turn, turn the heart of the, of the fathers, fathers to, to the children, children and the heart of the children to the fathers. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. I think I'm beginning to understand why families are so important to the Mormons. Is this a reason you keep a journal? To have a record of your family history? Well, it is one reason. Might I ask you a difficult question? Please. Well, theoretically speaking, 
Is it possible then that even I might enter into the temple and receive these ordinances? The temple is for anyone who is living in accordance with the commandments that God has given with respect to the temple. But one doesn't just walk into a temple. No. Even in the days of Solomon's temple, there were certain laws of purification that had to be met before one was allowed to enter the temple. Today, even those who are members of the church must first spiritually prepare themselves and be worthy to receive these blessings. And this is because those who are not properly prepared, such as myself, might not fully grasp their meaning. In their fullness, the realities of eternity are beyond our mortal capacity to comprehend. These covenants are given by revelation, and they can only be understood by revelation. Just as in the ancient temples we spoke of earlier, the temple is a place to which the saints can go and feel they are coming into the presence of the Lord. They learn important truths about their relationship to Him and the purpose of life. This is why we build temples. Well, I've heard you've already built others. Yes. Even while we're continued on the Salt Lake Temple. Nantai, Logan, St. George. Well, how many more will you build? As many as the Lord requires of us. July 25th, 1887. Brigham Young's successor, President John Taylor, died five minutes to eight o'clock p.m. This lays the responsibility of the care of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints upon my shoulders as president of the church. I pray God, my Heavenly Father, to give me grace equal to my day. Cyrus Edmund Dallin, a Utah bomb sculptor, was commissioned to create the statue of Angel Moroni for the east center spire of the temple, the capstone. After his design sketches were approved by the first presidency, he completed a 40-inch plaster model on October the 4th, 1891. The full-scale statue was cast in Salem, Ohio, and stood 12 and a half feet tall. Dallin later claimed that his inspiration for the statue of the angel Moroni came from the writings of the Apostle John. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Well, I suppose I'm not that familiar with the scriptures after all.
If there is any scene on the face of this earth that will attract the attention of the God of heaven and the heavenly host, it is the one before us today. The assembling of this people, the shout of Hosanna, and the laying of the capstone of this temple in honor to our God. My brethren and sisters, we want to finish this temple. We want to dedicate it to God as soon as we can, so that the vast hosts that dwell in this region may go into it and attend to the ordinances for the living and for their dead. Attention, all ye house of Israel, and all ye nations of the earth, we will now lay the capstone of the temple of our God, the foundation of which was laid and dedicated by the prophet, seer, and revelator, Brigham Young. Brethren and sisters, believing that the instruction of President Woodruff concerning the completion of the Salt Lake Temple is the word of the Lord unto us, I propose that this assemblage pledge themselves collectively and individually to complete the work on the interior of this temple, that the dedication may take place one year hence, on the sixth day of April, 1893, 40 years to the day of the laying of the cornerstones of this temple. So the capstone ceremony marked the completion of the stonework on the temple. That's right. All the scaffolding was removed and the attention was turned to finishing and decorating the interior of the building. With only one year to complete it? Oh, yes. Practical experienced men had declared to me that three years, too, at the very least, was required to complete the work on the temple. Nevertheless, every class of skilled artisans necessary were brought into service. These were men and women who consecrated their time and talents, many at great sacrifice. They may never be known or receive worldly credit, yet the beauty of their work will stand as a testimony of their devotion, faith, and love of God. The speed with which the work progressed was nothing short of miraculous.
But the work on the interior was completed only earlier this evening, was it not? Not a moment too soon, wouldn't you say? <laughs> Thank you for your interview, President. You've given me much to write and think about. Good morning, brethren. Good morning, President. Well, this is the day we've been waiting for. The weather's turned a bit nasty. Well, I don't suppose that should come as a surprise. Brethren, I think I should like to have a few words with our friend. I'll join you momentarily, if you would. Of course, President. If you should need any help, Thank friend. you, Joseph. I'll be fine. Well... Good morning, President. You're here quite early, Mr. Callahan. Well, wanted to see what I could. Dedication. And what do you see? I don't know quite how to write about all this. So, this is what Brigham Young saw all those many years ago, and in the middle of a desert wilderness, no less. We stood not far from here. I wish you could join us inside, Brother Callahan. I too, President. Then, perhaps someday, friend. Yes, perhaps. And that was the last I ever saw of President Wilford Woodruff. As I watched this servant of the Lord walk back to the temple, I was reminded of something he had mentioned the night before, almost in passing. When the saints first petitioned for statehood back in 1850, they wished to call their state Deseret. But one senator, not too favorably disposed towards Mormons, decided that they should have the name Utah after the Ute Indians. It was not until years later that I came across the meaning of the word Utah. It means top of the mountains. And I thought of the words of the prophet Isaiah. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. and all nations shall flow unto it. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer.